And it's going live shortly. It tells me it is live. So okay. welcome everyone to this evening's meeting of the Health and Wellbeing Board. I'm Councillor Josh Blacker, Cabinet Member for Healthy Lives and Chair of the Board. Um, we do have a new member of the board this evening, so we'll do some very quick introductions um, shortly just so that everyone knows who everyone is. Um, but before we do that, I have a couple of apologies for absence. Uh, Councillor Mason, unfortunately, is um, on other business and is substituted by Councillor Donnelly this evening. Um, and Councillor Raza is also chairing another meeting this evening, so can't be with us. Um, so we do just for Claire's benefit, if, if no one else is, um, do some very quick introductions just so everyone knows who everyone is. Um, and I'll go in the order that people are on, on my screen, if that's all right. So Steve, if you'd like to very briefly introduce yourself. Yeah, certainly. Uh, as you say, uh, Chair, I'm Councillor Steve Donnelly. I'm substituting for Peter Mason this evening. I'm the Cabinet Member with Responsibility for Inclusive Economy, which Thanks. is finance and related activities. Well, we, we don't spend any money on, on health and wellbeing at all, so it's <laughs> entirely irrelevant. Um, Councillor Conti. Hi, I'm Councillor Conti. I'm a Hang Hill councillor and I'm the shadow um, spokesperson for health and social care. Thanks. And Claire. I'm Claire Dillon. Um, I will be taking over the role that Chris Hilton was in previously, um, which is the Director of Integrated Community Health Services, and I'm employed by West London. Great. Well, welcome to the Health and Wellbeing Board. Uh, Anna. Good evening, everyone. I'm Anna Bryden, Director of Public Health at the Council. Neha. Good evening, everyone. I'm Neha Anadkat. I'm the Borough Director for um, E-Link Borough, part of Northwest London Clinical Commissioning Group. Kerry. Good evening. My name is Kerry Stevens. I'm Director of Adult Social Care for the Council. Great. Cam. Good evening, everyone. I'm Councillor Kamal Jitnagpal, and I'm Cabinet Member for A Fairer Start, which covers children's services and education. Matthew. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Van Mo. I'm the Ops Manager for Health Watch Ealing. Welcome, Simon. Good evening. I'm Simon Crawford, Deputy Chief Exec at London Northwest Healthcare Trust, uh, which uh, obviously runs Ealing Hospital as well as Norfolk Park at Central Middlesex. Thank you. And Vijay. I am uh, Dr. Vijay Taylor, GP, under clinical lead for Elin and part of Northwest London Governing Body. Thank you. Uh, all, uh, I don't know if you want to say hello. You're not, not a member of the board, but just here to observe. Um, it's from our cabinet office. Um, yes, evening, everyone. So I'm the new support cabinet officer and I'm assisting um, Councillor Blacker, uh, Nagpal and Raza. So um, just here to observe this evening and take some notes. Great. Thanks, Ola. Um, I don't have any urgent matters. Um, does anyone have any relevant declarations of interest that they need to make this evening? No? Wonderful. Um, and there are no matters to be considered in private, so that's the easy bits out of the way. Um, does anyone have any comments on the minutes of the 6th of October meeting, or can we take those as accurate? I'm getting shakes and nods, which I'm assuming is both, no, I have no comments and nods that we can take them um, as approved. So those are approved and we can virtually sign those, uh, which takes us on to the Health Watch update. Um, so over to you, Matt. Thank you very much. Yeah, very straightforward one from me um, this evening, which makes a change. Um, and it's actually from our um, service provider who as many of you know, is Your Voice in Health and Social Care. Um, so Your Voice recently uh, won the opportunity to um, conduct this research piece across the Health Watch boroughs um, that it provides. Um, so there are five um, Health Watch in total under the Your Voice banner. Um, and essentially the project is looking for people um, who have recent experience of MedEquip services um, to form a user group panel. Um, so what we're really asking for is just support from partners to 
um, advertise and promote this user group. Um, essentially, it will be done in two stages. So um, individuals who join the user group will um, join monthly for six months um, and help draft a feedback survey, which will then be sent to all Mediquip users in London. Um, following on from this, the group will then have a look at the survey, look at the results, um, and based on the results, come up with a set of recommendations um, for Mediquip to take forward. So it's a really big and really important piece of work. Um, and we're currently advertising across the five boroughs. Um, if I just have a look at the poster here to read out to you. So applications are taking place obviously this month and February with the first meeting taking part taking place, sorry, on the 23rd of March. Um, so obviously any support that um, you all could provide would be really appreciated. Um, and I may not be able to answer questions at this point because it is very much your voice run. Um, so if I can't, I'm happy to um, take it back and then get back to you in the next couple of days. Thank you. Any questions for Matt then? Uh, Kerry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Matt, just checking that you've got contact with Greg Pugh, who's the lead contract manager for Ealing for the uh, Mediquip equipment contract. Have I shared the details with you? Yes, you have you? actually. Yeah. Thank you, Kerry. And the secondary question, Matt, is it would be worthwhile engaging with the power group for people with learning disabilities to ensure we've got the right um, messaging and, and engagement with people with learning disabilities so they can engage with the programme? Perfect, thank you very much. And Neha. Um, thank you, Matt. I'm not sure if I have received this one to circulate out to our, um, uh, our residents that we get, um, well, we send out through our GP practices um, to see if anybody wants to get involved. Would that be of help? If it is, if you could send me a separate email about that, I will make sure that's circulated. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be sure to do that. Thank you, Neha. Great. Well, Kerry's response suggests to me that we're doing what we can to get to get that out ourselves, and I think Neha as well. So I think you've got the board's broad support there to get that out. Um, got it. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully, we'll get a copy of the findings. Um, yes. Yeah. One absolutely. of your future updates. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. It seems like, yeah, it seems like an interesting piece of work and, and important one. So thank you for doing well. Thank you to your your voice um, to, for doing it, um, but to you for bringing it here. So thank you. Is there anything else you wanted to update us on or? Um, so it's very much kind of like a, a transitionary uh, month for Health Watch. We have three reports coming up, but they just uh, missed the deadline for this um, for this meeting. So it will be all in the next meeting. Brilliant. Okay, thanks, Matt. Which takes us on. Uh, I'm scroll back to my front page um, to the COVID nineteen update, um, which will be from Anna. Um, and just before she starts, I'm hopeful <laughs> that this is going to be kind of the last update in this format that we do at the Health and Wellbeing Board. Um, obviously, a, a lot of the data that will that Anna can give is available elsewhere, um, and as I've said, I think previous meetings we want to try and get the board back to focusing on the development of and monitoring of the health and well-being strategy. Um, so there are other forums we can discuss um, COVID numbers in and, and make sure that it's pub, you know publicly available elsewhere. Um, so hopefully, unless anything major happens, which I think Anna, we're hopefully it's not. Um, you know, I, I don't think we'll have this item um, at the next meeting. But I say that with trepidation and caution. Um, given we know what happens with these situations. So, Anna, over to you. Thank you, Chair. I think Kerry is going to very um, think helpfully um, share slides. Um, I'm going to do the first few slides and then Neha is going to finish off with a couple of vaccinations. Um, so, it's, um, it's uh, I, I share Councillor Blacker's hope here, but it has been quite a lively couple of months since the board last met in COVID world. Um, so, just next slide, um, Kerry, please. And Kerry, so, if you can put um, it on screenshot, screenshot mode, screen, uh, presentation mode. Sorry, that's the one. Thank you. 
Thanks, Kerry. Uh, thanks. So um, uh, Ealing, along with um, the rest of the country, particularly London, had a very, very large peak um, uh, over Christmas and the New Year um, um, after the um, Omicron variant um, came into the UK in early December. Um, so the, uh, your screen is funny, but I'll keep going anyway. Um, um, sorry. Um, so um, the peak um, in uh, London was uh, 20, 29th of December, um, and I think on New Year's Eve, the Office of National Statistics estimated that one in 10 people in London had COVID, um, which is quite um, interesting. Um, uh, we're looking at a, a, a mix now because the number of cases got so high and there was so much change happening over the last um, month or so. We look at both the cases and the national survey estimates um, of how um, 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 how high COVID is, um, both of which are given the same sort of pattern, which is rates are generally across the UK coming down quite rapidly, um, particularly in London that went up higher than other areas. Um, and you can see that in the graph. So Ealing, other, oh, you can't see that in the graph, apologies, I can. Um, e Ealing um, uh, is going down. Um, uh, other parts of London went up uh, more quickly and sooner um, than we did in Northwest London. And now you can see the flip side of that, which Northwest London is now going down a little bit later, but still at the same pace as the rest of London. Um, but Ealing has been one of the highest boroughs in London over the last um, week or so. Um, we are now starting to see possibly a little bit of a plateauing with rates at a quite a high level. So still at a level that was similar to last January. Um, so still relatively high, um, but with less of an impact in terms of people ending up in hospital and those unfortunately dying. Um, uh, within Ealing, we're seeing about 3,700 residents testing positive every week at the moment. So a rate of just over 1,000 per 100,000. That is significantly higher than London and the rest of England. Um, um, but um, like I said, Northwest London as a whole is high at the moment. Um, with schools having gone back um, and um, the uh, differences in vaccination opportunities across the age ranges, we are seeing again that the um, under um, 20s um, are um, significantly uh, a significant part of um, COVID now. So about 40% of cases are school aged children um, and we're particularly seeing an uptick in um, uh, primary aged children. Um, the good uh, message is that we are seeing um, across London a reduction in the over 60s, which is great because that went up quite steeply over the new year. Um, we have uh, seen deaths go up in Ealing, um, obviously still very low numbers, but they have increased over the last couple of weeks. Um, so in the last week, we actually had 11 deaths, whereas usually over the autumn we'd be seeing maybe three or four. Um, and that is actually higher than the England rate at the moment. Um, and we're seeing across nationally, we're seeing that um, plateauing in terms of deaths. So hopefully that will start coming down again soon. Um, I'll just keep going if that's okay, Chair, because the rest is quite text heavy. Um, so um, I'll just talk through. Um, so just wanted to talk through a couple of changes that have happened in the last couple of months since the board last met. So um, testing you'll have seen an awful lot of in the media. Um, demand got incredibly high over Christmas and New Year, both for PCR testing and for LFTs. Um, and we had we saw that impact locally in terms of availability of tests for our local residents. Um, in terms of LFTs, the council supported a lot of local organisations to get rapid access and um, where they couldn't get them through their normal routes. So things like TFL, the police, some of our mental health, early years, teams, etc., which was really good that we were able to do that quite quickly. So a big thank you to everyone involved. Um, we've now reverted our testing to kind of the core purpose of providing that for people uh, uh, disproportionately impacted. Um, and... Um, um, sorry, I just my computer is frozen. Um, we our funding for that is confirmed till the end of March, along with a lot of the other COVID funding. So we are just waiting to see what national government does with that, and that will really impact what we do after March locally. Um, and then just wanted to mention you'll have also seen um, in uh, about a week or so ago we had a lot of changes to self isolation policy. So um, if someone now gets a positive on a lateral flow test, so they're the rapid home testing kits they're saying the rates are so high that you just count it as a positive. Um, you don't have to go ahead and get a PCR test to confirm and you should treat that um, as a, a sign to self-isolate. Um, you also can um, leave self-isolation earlier now. So if you test negative with an LFT on day five and six, you can, um, and don't have a temperature, you can leave self-isolation. 
And if someone is a contact, they're fully vaccinated or they're under 18, um, they don't have to self-isolate anymore, um, but they are strongly advised to take the lateral flow tests every day for seven days. So really just to help reduce the risks there. Um, so just moving on really briefly um, from me, contact tracing, um, as the rates got incredibly high um, over Christmas, um, um, a lot of our um, contact tracing of our local Ealing res residents was done by the national team rather than a local team, which was a shame, but everybody was followed up um, as appropriate. Um, uh, we are hoping now that the rates are getting to a stage where we can start taking them back locally and really following them up with, um, with our team. Um, and so that's continuing for now. And then just wanted to mention about key messages. Uh, because of the changes with Plan B, um, moving back to Plan A at a national level, there's been a lot in the media about um, kind of throwing caution to the wind or whatever the phrase is. Um, I think if you do look at the national government messages, they are still cautious. Plan A is still cautious to a large degree. So um, face coverings are still recommended, even though they're not mandatory um, in indoor settings where it's crowded, where you're meeting vulnerable people. Um, and we're still pushing that message through the council. So people come to council buildings, for example, that's still expected. Um, massive messages still out there um, in terms of getting vaccinated and getting your booster dose. Um, uh, ventilation, letting fresh air in, meeting outdoors when you can, really important. Um, and generally getting tested and self-isolating if required. So if people are going out and about to work, they're going out to meet friends or particularly anybody vulnerable um, taking LFT that morning, um, they're now very much um, back to normal in terms of availability. And then the last one from me before I hand over to Neha, um, uh, just wanted to mention a programme called Community Vaccine Champions. Um, we've been successful in um, a bid uh, with our national government colleagues um, to deliver this scheme. So Ealing's got £485,000, um, which is great news. Um, so that's to spend between now and July. Um, and this is really a programme. We, we've been doing a lot of elements of this, but really this really pushes it forward and builds on what we've been doing um, and gives us the resources to do that locally. So it's really about tackling misinformation about vaccines, promoting uptake among communities that have the lower rates, um, really focusing on those target groups with lower uptake that we've talked about here before. So especially, say, Black, Black British residents, um, more deprived areas, homeless people, um, some Eastern European groups, etc. Um, so champions will be rec recruited through a number of um, ways in terms of our community engagement networks, voluntary sector partners, youth services, etc. Um, recruitment for that will begin in the next few weeks and continue. Um, champions will be provided with training and support to share information with family, friends, workplaces, networks, etc. Um, obviously very much a voluntary role, but we absolutely welcome everybody who's interested and will provide support there in terms of training, regular briefings, opportunities to feedback and ways that people can go out into communities and you know feel safe doing that. So um, Neha, are you happy to um, carry on with slides seven and eight on vaccinations then? Yes, thank you very much. So <coughs> um, thank you. Um, so we have had uh, a major milestone that we've uh, met in Ealing, which I'm really, really pleased for, uh, where we've just inched over that 70% of our 16 plus population having had first dose. And we're about 65% have had both doses. Um, we've got about 43% uh, that have had boosters as well, which is um, fantastic. And it was a big push over the Christmas period, as you will all um, know, we've had um, great success with that. And even now we are doing, um, additional clinics in various settings. And we are running clinics at, um, for example, at St. Mary's Church in Acton. Um, we have been for the all of um, January, um, three days a week, and we've had fantastic successes there. In fact, even today, there were 15 patients that came for their first doses. So there, that um, people are still coming for first doses, for second doses, as well as for boosters. Uh, it is fair to say that the take-up rate of vaccinations post um, years has dropped, and that will be for a number of reasons, including people may have had COVID, so can't have a, uh, a vaccine for 28 days after that. But um, they are picking up, so there are patient uh, people still coming forward for their vaccinations, and we're doing a lot of targeted work, and the work that Anna was just talking about with the vaccine champions it will really help target and make sure that we're getting as many people to come and have their vaccines as possible. 
Um, we are really clear about the um, population groups with the lowest vaccination uptake. Um, but I, I think one of our successes has been that South Hall is still is quite a high take up of first vaccinations, but Acton is really low. So there is a variation across the borough, as we, we all know. <coughs> and where um, is the white, um, black Caribbean and gypsy and Irish travellers, um, traveller backgrounds have the lowest vaccination uptake in Ealing at the moment. So we'll be doing some targeted work with them. There's been a lot of work happening with homeless hostels and rough sleepers, and there's been really good attendance in trying to get um, them to come and have vaccination. So that's part of our first vaccination cohorts that we've had coming through, which is fantastic. And as you will you may remember, we had two of our primary care networks in the north of the borough that weren't signed up to the enhanced service to deliver vaccination. Um, they are all now signed up, so uh, we have 100% of our GPs supporting this vaccination program in Ealing. And we now have 47 of our 73 practices are delivering vaccinations from their own practices, so closer to home in a setting that people feel familiar um, to and are inviting their own patients in for vaccinations, <coughs> which is fantastic. Um, we've had some trouble over the last <coughs> week or so with some anti-vax um, people coming um, to be and being very disruptive at CP House, but we worked really closely with our local authority and police colleagues and CP House team to make sure that the, safe, uh, the staff are safe and the police um, response has been really fantastic. And um, uh, uh, thank you for all of the support that they've provided over the last week because it's it's quite distressing for staff who are just trying to do the best um, when they are then being targeted um, with some um, really quite uncomfortable um, actions of these teams. Um, I think the other thing to note is that CP House in Ealing is now the Northwest London um, site, designated site, to register when patients have had um, vaccinations overseas. So there is a site across every single um, integrated care system and CP House in Ealing is the one de um, designated uh, for Northwest London. So people can get an appointment. They are quite busy so that anyone that's had an overseas registration uh, vaccination can have that added in. Okay, just uh, next slide, please. Thank you. And then, um, as you will all have heard in the um, news and um, the uh, briefings that we've had, uh, as this programme of vaccination is a condition of deployment for both health and social care workers. As you will remember, we've done a lot of work and our, our local authority colleagues have done a lot of work with our care home settings in the past with great success. And um, uh, most patient, um, staff going into those settings and anybody now entering those settings have to have um, had their fully, um, their two vaccinations at least. And as you know, that there is the requirement that from 1st of April, um, these will be mandatory for um, domiciliary care workers, health and social care um, settings. Um, we've, been a lot of, we've been doing a lot of work over the last couple of weeks since the guidance has come out to uh, understand the position, try and support our staff to have the vaccinations um, and understand where those gaps are. We've got some data here on the slides um, around first dose and second doses for home care staff that has already improved. It's now 87% of people have had their first doses and 80% um, have had second doses. Um, and the boosters are still quite low, but we had a fantastic conversation with one of our colleagues, Gordon, from the local authority this afternoon, who is um, taking this work um, forward as he did with the care homes and with the domiciliary care workers and is really focusing in on up till the 3rd of February to really focus in on those that haven't had a first dose at least. So then so as third of you have the all of these people will have to have had the first dose by 3rd of February to be able to have the second dose by 31st of March. So he's focusing in on those for the first um, dose by 3rd of February and then between the 4th of February to the end focusing on the second doses 
and then really focusing in on on the boosters so um it's some great work so we don't know what the um impact will be of that as yet but that's what we know at the moment similarly we've been doing work across our health partners and our council staff for anybody entering into a cqc registered um, site and understanding the vaccination status of our staff staff including our clinical commissioning group staff mm. um, and um, so far with our primary care general practice workforce the uh, impact in Ealing, there are a few, um, there are about 15 staff so far, the clinical staff that we've identified, but 50 overall across our whole workforce in general practice in Ealing. Um, all practices have been offered support and all staff have been offered support with individual conversations, but also webinars and FAQs about the vaccination. And it's very easy to get the vaccination as well. So happy to take any questions on any of that. We can take slides down. Great, thanks Anna and Neha. Um, Councillor Conti has his hand up. Thank, thank you. I just had a couple of questions regarding uh, vaccination. So on second doses for children in school, so for 12 to 15 year olds, uh, is that just through like the national booking system or, or, on, or, or is the vaccination team going back into schools to give the second dose similar to the first one and what sort of the time scale for that to, to happen um, and then for children five to eleven who are at risk in terms of the plan that they now obviously they can now have a first dose what's sort of the plan um, to try and get that uh, happening and then just in the last thing you touched on about um, staff so obviously 15 clinical staff and 50 overall w would in terms of sort of distribution of that is that sort of spread quite evenly across sort of practices or are there particular practices that you know may really struggle in terms of obviously I know general practices as a whole is under uh, pressure and, and sort of thin on workforce but are particular practices at risk of closure or not being able to function um, if you know if those staff don't aren't vaccinated and the rules remain as they are by uh, by April. Um. Thank you. Chair, is it okay for answer? Yeah, go ahead. I don't, I don't know if you want VJ to come in on some of the wider general practice bits. Um, yeah, uh, so I, if I start with what I have, so the schools programme has restarted again. So there were three schools, for example, this week, but um, a number of sites have now been assured to do the 12 to 15 as well, including pharmacy. So it can be via the schools. So there'll be a rolling programme for the Northwest London team going into all the schools again, but also via various sites that are, um, are available via the national booking system. So there are two routes now for school children to get their second doses. For the five to 11 year olds, we are just, we've just received some of the guidance. The training is happening and we are um, identifying sites who want to take on the five to 11 year old um, cohort. Um, the vaccination, the, the actual vaccine itself hasn't yet been distributed but uh, and there'll be targeted cohorts but I'll let VJ come in on that but just before I do I'll just talk about the 15 staff in primary care they aren't um, aggregated in one practice or anything they are quite evenly spread so it's not from what we can tell at this point and it is still um, early stages we don't think there is any practice in particular that's at risk although any member of staff um, uh, leaving is um, a hit to a small team working in general practice, as you will know, but um, we will provide whatever support we can. But this has been coming for some time, which everyone knows. Yeah, and ju just to add, particularly on the uh, the five to 11 vulnerable children, so we've asked practices to run the searches to identify these children. Obviously, clearly from an individual practice perspective, it will be just a handful of handful of children in that cohort um, and we once we've done this mapping exercise and then we can then really understand to focus how we're going to deliver because um, the pediatric Pfizer uh, vials they come in doses of 20 per vial so clearly we need to make sure that we don't waste any vaccines so we need to have focused delivery of that 5 to 11 uh, cohort um, across Ealing. Uh, so once we've once we've done that mapping exercise and we've secured the vaccine because the vaccine 
but the paediatric vaccine hasn't arrived yet. But once we've got that, then we'd be able to then mobilise the, the communications out to those parents for, the, for those children. Um, with respect to the um, mandatory uh, uh, COVID vaccination, like, like Neha said, there isn't, so far, there isn't a single uh, GP practice which is at risk. Um, um, there's no single one that is flagged um, in terms of uh, uh, the number of staff who are currently not vaccinated. Most practices, if they have any, will be either um, none or one. Um, I guess my, 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 my biggest concern is, is the 15 clinical staff um, <clears throat> in terms of um, how, how, how we engage with those 15 clinical staff to ensure that they, in terms of their, their, their decision making, but then what, what is the alternative for their, their, their job role and their contribution? Um, that, that for me is probably the biggest challenge. Thanks, BJ. Uh, Councillor Donnelly. Thanks, Chair. As, so my, I'll reverse the order I was going to ask them in because the, one of them is connected, I think, to that last part, which is about the, the care staff, the clinical staff. I, mean, it, I imagine it must be almost really exasperating for those of you um, in the front line um, finding colleagues who are, you know, yeah, uh, well, they're obstructing our ability to deliver service, and, and, and inexplicably to someone like me, you know, it, inexplicably. But on on the specific, there was the the stat about the number of first jabs, second jabs, and boosters, and the number of boosters seemed extraordinarily low relative to the first and second jabs, which I guess could only work statistically if a huge number of them had only they'd only ever started having jabs very recently and that the vast majority of them hadn't had any jabs at all until quite recently because once once you get once you get the the sort of sequence going so but but that 19% or whatever it was just seemed extraordinary low so that that was one so it's and i guess the my other question again it's more about the trying to explore the why's rather than just the what and it, um, as, a, as someone who represents an Acton ward, I think we've been aware for some time that we've got an issue this, you know, at, at this point in the cycle around Acton. But just, you know, can can somebody can somebody explain to me better than I currently understand why we think that is the case? Um, uh, because we we got St Mary's now. Was that? Was it not having somewhere like that um, initially? But then we got CP House in the middle of Ealing, where where the uh, the lunatics are attempting to take over the um, the building. Uh, what what? So, uh, rather than just well, these are the stats. Why do we why do we think Acton is running significantly behind other areas, given that its demographic is not so different in many respects? to other parts of the borough yeah it's uh, i guess it's it's, it's a uh, multifactorial that 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 answer as you know in, in acton so in terms of first dose in acton yes they they, they have been acton has been playing catch up compared to the other uh, the other wards since the the covid vaccination program um began um part of that may be due to the fact that um, um when the vaccination program was rolled out there wasn't a, a single uh, community pharmacist, pharmacy that engaged in that process of delivery of the COVID vaccination. So that may have been, had an impact in terms of nowhere permanently local for the Acton residents to go to. Um, they had to go um, um, to CP House, but then we also obviously, we did have the Ealing Town Hall has the other uh, site that we were using, which was a, a, a PCM GP delivered. Uh, delivered site and um from from what i uh, understand in the feedback some of some of our uh, um cohorts in, in act and particularly our um black african caribbean have been particularly hesitant um to have the covid vaccination and, and as we, we all know there are 
certain pockets of that cohort of the population reside in um, um, in Acton. I think what has what has improved is having local provision. So having the Acton, having a church in Acton, but then also more recently, um, due to changes in terms of delivery of the vaccine, individual practice in Acton are now delivering the, 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 the COVID Pfizer vaccine. So that has been having a certain level of um, uh, of impact. Um, but I, you know, I really don't know whether Acton will ever get to the same levels of, for example, Central Ealing, which has the highest uptake of, of COVID vaccine. I, I doubt it we will ever get to that point, um, but we can only continue to try and really sort of, I think the COVID vaccination uh, champions uh, and, and the resource that we've got now available will hopefully be able to work within these communities and really to get a good understanding of what their concerns and issues are. And hopefully, like, like Neha said, um, the ones who still require the first, they will start to come forward like they have, for instance, today, we had a 15 new, 15 uh, uh, first vac vaccinations today at Acton, which is, you know, 15 is, is, is better than none. So that's really, that's still positive for my mind. Thanks, Vijay. I don't, don't know, Anna, if it's helpful to circulate the research that the council assisted with in terms of uh, hesitancy and vaccine um, equity, um, because we did do a piece of work. Um, Anna, I, you explain it, because... <laughs> <Well, laughs> we've, we we've had some academic partners who were looking for a borough to work in um, within London around vaccine hesitancy, and we ended up um, very lucky getting them working in Ealing. Um, so a lot of what they've found is uh, what you hear from all the national research, but it's really helpful to have that as very much a local voice. Um, and um, a lot of it's around um, all, all the things you've heard about. So um, trust in the health system, trust in the public sector, um, a lot of younger people not feeling that they're vulnerable, not feeling that it's worth the risk. All of the myths that we've been hearing about in terms of um, fertility um, issues, pregnancy, obviously there were different messages early on, etc. Um, various social media um, issues flying around um, in terms of some of those myths as well. So it's a real mix, but yeah, definitely I can send them, um, that's published now, so I can send um, Keith that link. Um, that, that academic team's still working in Ealing, still doing some of that engagement with local communities, both adults and young people, um, and their work has been helping to inform the um, community champions work as well. So they've been really involved and really keen to help support that, which has been great. Thanks, Anna. And I think the, the, the age point is an important one because I think Acton is significantly younger than the rest of the borough as well. So it, it all adds up. Um, Neha. Um, I was just wondering if vaccine is a condition of a de deployment work. I wasn't able to pull in any information around our local um, large health providers. And I wonder if Simon and Claire could just provide us with an update on where they've got to as well. Right. And before before they do, if I can just um, carry, I don't know if you want to talk about the, the boost in, in the home care staff point that um, Steve asked about. I, th I think it's a good point, Steve, but it's a difficult one for us to come to any specific conclusions with regard to um, the booster programme. We're working very hard with the sector to maximise the boosters because we know that they're really important. I think the, the work of Gordon and the team, as Neha referenced earlier, to maximise uptake of the first and second vaccine for um, reasons of employment and deployment within the sector is, has been our main focus, but booster is something we'll be looking at. If I could just say, Chair, that we do, in terms of uptake of the vaccine across the care sector as a whole, there are a number of providers that have low vaccine uptake, and we're working very closely with those. Um, we think that those, I think it's three or four providers where there's particularly low uptake of vaccine are influencing on the overall performance of the figures. So the 87% is good, but if then you look at the two or three providers where there's issues with uptake of vaccine and we're targeting those at the moment, then we should see some significant improvement. Thanks. Uh, Anna? Thanks, Chair. Just to add to that point about um, the third dose, um, 
anecdotally in Ealing as, as uh, across the country, we have been seeing third dose hesitant or booster hesitancy specifically. Um, it's not down as mandatory for things like um, travel to certain countries, um, health and care staff as part of their employment, um, COVID passports when they existed. Um, so it's the, the messaging out there isn't so much uh, that it's needed. Um, although that might, I suspect that might come with time. Um, I think also um, after the first two have been over quite a few months, the third one comes along. I think there's a lot of that um, messaging conversations out there, especially among on social media about this is the start of regular vaccines and we're going to have to have these for the rest of our lives. So there is specific hesitancy issues around the third dose. Um, it's not surprising that the boosters not getting as high as we want to um but um we'll wait and see and obviously the work's going on in gordon's team and colleagues and um, to push that forward thanks thanks and then claire simon if you wanted to if you've got any update on uptake in your settings so, so in terms of london northwest uh our permanent staff base is about eight and a half thousand we're currently at 600 st permanent staff who, who are not vaccinated that is subject to further sort of scrutiny and challenge in terms of evidence. So, so we've written to the staff, individual uh, conversations take, uh, i.e. we haven't got the evidence. Some of them may have the evidence. So for instance, we know our we've got a tranche of overseas nurses who joined us as part of their condition of employment. They had to, they had to have, have those, but they're not on the national system at the moment. So there'll be a chunk of those that will be compliant. Like has already been said, I think we're having lots of individual conversations with line managers with the staff. We're also doing lots of question and answer sessions led by our HR director and uh, and uh, um, um, occupational health 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 team, and and there's no doubt there is a cohort that 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 is afraid. I think, and and so we're trying to reassure them with 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 uh, people from similar communities and similar backgrounds who've had the vaccine. And as necessary, providing support, someone going with them to have the vaccine and, and those kind of things. So, so we do expect it to come down from, from where it is. We have seen some good progress in areas we were particularly worried about in terms of our consultant workforce and, and indeed some of our nursing hotspots like maternity, etc. But those those have, have significantly in, improved. So I don't think we have a particular service we're concerned about, um, but, but there, there are pockets across the organization at particular bands or levels or backgrounds uh, where, where we're targeting for further further support i'm happy to come in so it's very similar for um across our providers so at the moment letters have gone out to employees and there's lots of supportive conversations and it, similarly with different um different groups different backgrounds um encouraging sort of staff to talk with one another as well. Um, the numbers are coming down. So a number of people have had their first vaccine in the last week. Um, and so I think some of the hesitancy is being addressed by um, some of the information that we're getting out in the work. We don't have any one service that we think is sort of um, in a critical position. Um, there are, we're, we're looking at a sort of patient facing staff and then kind of admin staff looking at redeployment within the um, services as well. But at the moment, I think we're staying positive and think that we'll, we will make progress. And as Simon's highlighted, for some people, we're managing to um, get the information that they have actually had the vaccine. It's just that it wasn't registered through our um, HR system. So there's a tranche that will, will sort of naturally fall into the vaccinated group when we get the data right. So, um, yeah, we're, we're sort of staying positive at the moment. Right. Thank you. Um, and thank you again to Neha and your team for pulling together a <laughs> very challenging program of vaccinations. Um, and I know Peter and I wrote to you, uh, but very happy again to confirm that, you know, the council will do whatever we can um, to support and whatever you need. So, you know, do continue the dialogue with us as I know we do on a <laughs> regular basis anyway, but just to formally, formally kind of remind everyone that, you know, we are supporting the programme as, as, as much as we can. And I know we haven't, uh, we have occasionally challenged you uh, in terms of pushing for, for ACT and particularly, um, but, you know, that comes with support as well. So I know we've been supporting the St Mary's and we'll continue to do so. So thank you very much, um, Neha and to Anna for the update. Um, we have an update from Simon on the Northwest Healthcare Trust, um, the winter pressures and how we did over winter. 
Yes. Uh, how we're doing, I think, is it still plays because I think it's still continuing. We, we may be seeing a bit, a bit of less pressure in terms of COVID, but we're still seeing plenty, plenty, plenty of pressure across, across the system. I'm not sure if someone could share my slides for me. I, I think Kerry may have a go if you can, but otherwise I'll just I'll just speak. Um, but 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 I think uh, where we are at the moment, I think at the time the slides were prepared, we had about 20 percent of our beds across the trust occupied by uh, uh, COVID positive patients. Um, uh, that has reduced now to about fourteen percent. And at Ealing this morning, there were thirty seven beds occupied. Uh, by COVID patients. That's still fairly significant. It's a lot less than the 80 or 90 uh, plus that, 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 that we had just our, our, after Christmas, but it still puts pressure on, 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 the, on, on our, our, our bed base. So as of this morning, we had, <clears throat> for instance, five patients waiting for a bed. I had been a decision to admit in A&E overnight and there was no bed for them to go to. So it's really important that uh, we do well on our discharges. And I'll say more about that as, 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 as I go, go through. Uh, in response to COVID, we increased our critical care beds across our two sites. So, so 24 at uh, Northwick, 12 on the Ealing site. And again, over the last few weeks, they've been under con constant pressure in terms of one in, one out. So this morning, uh, whilst we got the physical capacity for 12, there were 11 patient, patient, patients in. So, so considerable pressure and, and five of those were, were COVID positive. It's worth saying that the majority of patients in the hospital with COVID are unvaccinated. Um, uh, and and, and, and the, 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 certainly the ones that end up in high dependency and critical care almost universally are not, are not vaccinated at, at all. In terms of our workforce absence rates increased to, to six, seven percent just after Christmas. It's now down to about six, six and a half, half, half percent. And that's two and just under 280 staff off this morning as a result of uh, COVID. Uh, but we continue to ensure that the services remain safe across all our, uh, all our wards and, and, and uh, functions. Uh, this constant daily sort of review of service pressures and moving staff around to make sure that patients are cared for, for safely. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our critical care uh, beds, we've got we've converted wards to, to red areas, i.e. those those for COVID positive patients, uh, and there's three the three of those at Ealing. Um, and I think the importance of that is 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 when we're converting. Um, wards to a particular type of function, i.e. those are those that, that would uh, cater for COVID positive patients. We've got the challenge then of, man of managing patients through different pathways through, through the hospital. So we might have COVID beds, but we haven't got non-COVID beds, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not a total pool. So it does put more pressure on us in terms of uh, managing uh, patients uh, over the winter period. And, Whilst that's less, less of an issue now, certainly over the last three or four weeks, that, that was a constant issue as we try, uh, we, we, we flipped from um, non-COVID wards to COVID wards, and then over the last two or three weeks, flipping back again from COVID as we reduce the number of COVID to, to, to non-COVID. So, so that, that provides us some challenges. Um, we, we, we have over the, over the last couple of weeks done, done a couple of uh, audits in terms of identifying um, uh, 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 of our COVID positive patients, whether they, they came into hospital primarily uh, because of COVID or whether COVID is, is an incidental uh, factor of, of, of their reason for being in hospital. I.e. they came in with another condition is what brought them into hospital, but because we're swabbing and testing everybody, we identified the fact that they were COVID positive. And, and as you can see there, about 45% uh, has consistently been, uh, been the sort of figure we've been identifying. And, and I think that's not, not indifferent to, to other organizations. Uh, clearly over the period, we've made sure that uh, one of the lessons learned for, from earlier and uh, not just for us, but for all organisations um, uh, around COVID, was making sure we've got plenty of good supplies of PPE, lateral flow tests, the access to the jabs, etc. So, so that has been the case this time around. 
and again, I, I mentioned set, set, set some of the pressure, pressure on, on, on the beds. If, if we're to maintain flow, then it, it's really important that we're able to discharge pa patients uh, safely out, out into the community. And again, over the last couple, couple of weeks, uh, uh, since before Christmas, there have been challenges in terms of access to, to nursing homes uh, because of outbreaks there. That reduces the number of places that uh, patients can go to. So there's clearly been an in, uh, emphasis on home first wherever we can, and also extended packages of care going into uh, um, uh, other facilities like uh, like like at home and and or indeed bed and breakfast on on times for for patients to try and. Uh, support them out, out, out of hospital. And, and at this point, it is worth me saying, we have had fantastic support from our partners, um, both, both at Northwick, but, but definitely at Ealing. Over the last couple of weeks, I've joined a number of the daily discharge calls. I've been massively impressed in terms of the attendance of senior people, senior decision makers that help us make decisions quickly to move patients into an appropriate care setting. So. Special thanks to West London Health and their team uh, for, for supporting that. A special mention to Kerry and his team uh, and, and uh, in, in terms of the support we've had from, from the social workers and, and, and the brokerage team and the placements that they've been able to facilitate for us. It really has felt joined up and, and we're enormously grateful for the support that, that we have had. because It has made a, a real difference in terms of us uh, caring for patients appropriately. Next slide, please, Kerry. Boss. Um, yeah, so so I've probably covered some of this. The, the hospitals A and E urgent treatment centres re remain very busy. E Ealing, for instance, yesterday, ninety six attendances, forty nine via via a LAS, thirty six admissions, twenty eight discharges yesterday. So a net loss of beds. So it's again, it comes back to the discharges. What's really important that, that that we keep on top of top of that day in day out. Some days we, 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 we discharge far more than we admit. Uh, and of course, it, it normally balances out across the week, but it is important every, every, every day uh, make, makes a difference and every, every discharge makes a difference to us. Um, flow is important in terms of ambulance handovers and, and you will have seen nationally, there's great pressure on, on acute trust to free up ambulances and not hold them inappropriately in, in, in excess of uh, uh, the expected times. We, we as a trust have massively improved our performance in that respect over, over the last, last, last few years. So whilst we do have the odd days where we're holding them much longer than we'd like, generally speaking, we, we, we're seen as, as, as performing extremely well. Um, <clears throat> the UTCs have uh, been key in, uh, in, in supporting us. And, and we at, at Northwick, we uh, Harrow Health, uh, with Brent and Harrow GPs have supported us in, in a new initiative in terms of front end redirection uh, from, from the UTC back into uh, GP appointments and other appropriate pathways or ho home with advice, etc. And it is something that we will perhaps be looking to try and model at, at Ealing as well. Um, and then we've done a lot in terms of expanding our same day emergency care facilities on the sites. Uh, at Ealing, so we've got 10 different pathways working for things like DVT, falls, chest pain, etc. So, so that we have access to uh, uh, clinical decision makers who are able to support uh, patients, assess patients uh, and support them and ideally try and get them home in the same day without the need, need to admit. And, and again, that, that, that's, that's been ex extremely uh, successful. Um, so before I move off the non-elective demand, uh, I did report at the RA and E delivery board yesterday, last week, so, so the importance of, of that discharge, last week, London Northwest, in terms of the, the CMH, at, uh, sorry, the Northwick Park and Ealing sites, we were first for length of stay uh, of less than seven days, first for length of stay less than 14 days, and second for length of stay over 21 days, so, so that's a fantastic achievement. And, and, and over the last you know, four to five weeks, it, it has improved significantly, in particular that 21 day length, length, length of stays has, has improved incredibly, as, as has the seven day actually. Um, so, so again, that, that, that's, that reinforces the support we've had from partners. We couldn't do that alone. Um, and then the final slide from me is, is, that's all very well in terms of the emergency path, pathway. 
uh, but it's really important that, that we've been able to maintain the elective uh, care uh, over over this period, and uh, and compared to the earlier waves, we we've maintained uh, most of our elective activity throughout 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 uh, uh, this this winter period. Clearly, over the Christmas period, we always take down elective activity between uh, Christmas and, and New Year, and 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 we took it down for the extra ex, extra week. Um, uh, coming back after Christmas because we, we knew in terms of the, the, uh, the, the COVID challenges we'd have. Uh, but by and large, we're back up to what we were doing sort of uh, in November time in terms of our elective lists and our diagnostics and our outpatients uh, are all working effectively. Um, and Ealing was slightly down on, on, on the list. And part of that is because we reinstated our emergency surgery overnight. You'll recall I reported to you that in response to COVID, the original wave, we'd stopped emergency surgery overnight at Ealing to free up a, a, an anaesthetist to support um, uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the elective uh, pathway and, uh, and, and the expansion of critical care previously. But from the I think it was something like the 12th or 13th of December, whichever was the Monday, uh, we recommenced emergency surgery over, over, overnight at Ealing. That did result in a couple of a lost lists at, e, uh, at, at, uh, at, at Ealing, but those, um, I, I think we're down to two, two, two lists down, and, and uh, some of that is being replaced by insourcing at the weekend, starting from this weekend for gynae and gen general surgery. So we're now in a strong position in terms of getting back to uh, what we were back in November in terms of our, our, our electives. Um, I, nothing else I think I want to draw attention to in, 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 in terms of those, those slides per se, but happy to take any, any questions. Brilliant. Thanks, Simon. It's a really helpful update. I know we we just, you know, we always discuss winter's coming and it's good to know that, you know, we have managed it really well. And thank you for the feedback um, on our part in helping you. Yeah, um, nice. Really helpful. And, you know, Kerry, I think, you know, it's down to your, your work and your team's work. So thank you so much um, from our position as, as the board. Um, does anyone have any questions for Simon? Councillor Conti. Thank you. Um, it was just really just to pick up on sort of outpatient appointments. And I know obviously a number of those are happening virtually. And this isn't ex this isn't something specifically about uh, sort of your trust in particular, but I I've lost count of the number of clinical letters that I see for when people have virtual appointments that say, try to phone patient, no answer, rebook in six months time. Um, I, I see less of like that every day. And the patient goes, well, I was there ready at my appointment time. And then someone called me four hours later, but I was at work and I couldn't answer. The, the numbers withheld, I can't call someone back. Um, and then my next appointment, my follow-up is in six months. And I don't know if, like, I, where I work, we don't we have very few patients going to uh, Ealing or, or Norfolk Park. So I don't know if that's a problem there, but I've seen that from letters from Charing Cross or from West Mid, from, from many. And I just wonder, you know, we may be ticking people off a waiting list and then having their next follow-up appointment but I just wonder how how many or is there any gauge of how with these virtual appointments what percentage of patients are actually being contacted are actually having successful appointments virtually because the impression I get is uh, I can't put a, a percentage figure on it but there is a sizable number who just seem to be getting pushed further and further along without actually having an interaction and I, I just worry about how that that's working and it's understandable because you know when you see someone face to face you're in a waiting room you know people are often running late i run late all the time and people you know wait half an hour but you know if on a telephone you're calling someone maybe one or two hours later they may not be in a position to answer that call anymore and i i'm just concerned a bit about that and then my, my, my second question was just about two week waits and in terms of are we you know what the, are we meeting the targets for suspected cancer patients in terms of them getting their, their first outpatient appointments? Um, so, 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 so if I take the, take the first, first one, so, so about 25% of our outpatient appointments uh, are, are, are virtual. And so, so, so those are completed and successful, successful appointments. I'm not, we definitely have had some complaints of, of the nature that, 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 that you described, but I don't think, I'm not aware that, that uh, we've got uh, 
um, uh, an overwhelming majority of complaints around our vir virtual appointment uh, pro process. Um, uh, it, it, it's certainly uh, not dominating the, the sort of complaint complaints complaints process. But if there are examples from 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 our trust where, where it's a particular issue, very happy for you to uh, uh, forward with me the, the details, and I'll I'll follow it up with the service. I don't necessarily need the patient detail, but but if you if if you want to give me the, the, the details of the service and the type of issue, I'm very happy to uh, fo follow follow that up uh, for you. Um, I'm sorry, your second question was. It was just on two week wait and camps, oh, on, on, on camps. two week wait. So, so so broadly speaking, we are doing pretty well on the two week waits because clearly into the cancer pathways, that's that's where 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 our, our major focus is in is in terms of trying trying to assess assess those. I think we've had some challenges around around the breast pathway, but actions been taken to 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 improve prove prove that. But generally speaking, we're we're doing pretty well based on the RM partners sort of feedback in terms of how how we compare with others on on the two week uh, pathway. All right, thank you. Are there any other questions for Simon? So I, I have I have a difficult one, which is I think when I last looked at the numbers, we had about forty three and a half thousand people across northwest London on waiting lists, which is you know you know with record highs sure. um, across the country. I suppose the question is, you know, given everything that's happening, when do we think can we get back to a situation that is more normal? Because you know, and it's not your fault. It's not particular pressures of the trusts or anything it's a national issue of funding and staffing can we ever get to the point where we are meeting targets for waiting lists and waiting times after covid uh, without any major change in how the system how the system is funded and operated um yes yeah, so, 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 so it's definitely challenging and, and, and clearly though, though though it has grown what i would say in terms of london northwest we are we 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 sort of stabilised. I think the size of our, our our waiting list overall, um, and and in and even despite um, uh, the last sort of six to eight weeks, uh, we have reduced our number of uh, patients waiting uh, over over a hundred and four weeks uh, for procedures, and reduced our uh, our number of uh, patients waiting over over fifty two weeks. Um, so, so we're expecting to eradicate all the 104 week waiters by 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 the end of March. We were uh, up around 400 at the end end of September. We're expecting to 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 eradicate that. So, so, so that's come down down significantly, and uh, our our 52 week wake waiters are about uh, 130 odd, and we expect to get that down to about 30 by the end end, end of March. Clearly, we'll try and do better. But based on the trajectory and the capacity we've got for the type of, because it really depends what what's, what the, what sort of uh, uh, procedures that they're, they're waiting waiting for. So 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 up, upper GI, uh, we we've got more challenges around that pathway and some of the gyne gyne path, path, pathways. Uh, but we still expect to get it down to less than thirty. If we can do better, we will. Just just to just to add, um, just from a. From an ICS perspective, as everyone knows, you know, the recovery is, is going to be number one priority for the ICS going forward. Um, and, you know, um, as Simon says, work is in progress in, in, in our um, admitted and non-admitted pathways, particularly in relation to our 52-week waiters. And so every every trust across Northwest London is, is focused. We have, a, we have a common PTL across Northwest London. So, so that um, each of the trusts are working together to, in terms of managing that uh, patient tracker uh, tracker list. Um, work work is underway to try and um, increase turnover, particularly of those um, high volume, low acuity, low acuity procedures. Yeah. Yeah. So we can try and you know you know work on those on those very large waiting lists that we have. But you know, but realistically, Joss, you know, I. I would say we're looking at least at least eighteen months, two years, um, to be honest, in terms yeah, of yeah. that that road that road map to recovery for for the NHS. Um, you know, we we need to be 
we need to be real. We need to be realistic. Um, it's, you know, we're not going to turn it turn it around overnight, and, and no one expects us to do that. Um, but we do need to work in a in, in a in a collective response, and that's what the the ICS will be doing um, um, over the, over the next twelve to eighteen months to achieve that. Thank you both, and thank you, Simon, again for the update. Uh, very helpful, and I'm I'm sure Kerry wants to carry on working 24/7 to <laughs> support discharges, um, and I'm sure Steve wants to carry on paying for it. Um, <laughs> but um, it's a challenge. Um, but as, as always, you know, we will do what we can to support support you, um, just as I'm sure um, you will do what you can to support us um, in, with those issues. Um, so thank you, Simon, for that update. Um, I have said before that I want to get the board back to focusing on health and wellbeing strategy. One of the things we need to do to get that is, I think, Anna, the pharmaceutical needs assessment. Yeah, thank you, Chair. So um, just wanted to do a quick verbal update at this board and the next board will um, bring a, um, a formal uh, mini decision paper. So uh, pharmaceutical needs assessment is something that the health and wellbeing board has mandated to reduce about. Um, Every three years, um, we do a re review um, across the local partners um, to help inform decisions about whether local um, pharmaceutical services um, in Ealing should change, what the local needs are. Um, so, for example, it helps make decisions about um, if potential pharmacy contractors want to open a new premises or um, uh, pharmacies or commissioners want to identify new services that they could provide. Um, this will help uh, be that decision making paper. Um, it's quite a, a big task every few years. Um, it should have been done last year, but obviously with COVID, um, the government deferred that until um, last year. So we started a process and we've got an external Anna, provider are... called Saw Beyond, um, yeah. who we commissioned to carry this out. Anna, you're breaking up slightly, so I don't know if you might want to just drop your camera off to try and save some bandwidth, because you're dropping it in and out, but try it again with yeah, the camera. Apologies. Let me try again. Uh, so we have got um, uh, Saw Beyond, who are a, a commissioned service, a provider to help support this. Um, and we have got a steering group up and running now. Um, we have been out um, to do the first stage of the public consultation on this in December. Um, so that was both out to members of the public. So, for example, through pharmacies and libraries, asking questions about their local pharmacy services, what they like, what's the challenge, what they'd like to see. Um, and we've also been going out through um, a lot of our partner organisations, um, um, especially to um, people like GP practices, for example, or to pharmacists themselves to do some of that consultation as well. Um, we're expecting uh, to review that at the next steering group meeting in a few weeks time. Um, and we've also been doing a lot of work in the background, doing a, um, assessing what the local needs are and how pharmacists can help meet those needs. Um, so uh, we will be um, aiming to go out for a public consultation on that final draft um, between May and July, um, and with the final PNA available in September. Um, what we will bring, if the board's happy, to the next meeting is a very mini formal paper that, as with the last PNA in 2018, um, that the Health and Wellbeing Board just formally delegates the authority to the steering group to um, take that forward and sign it off. Um, so it doesn't need to come here for uh, detailed conversations, but I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you. Great, thank you. It sounds like a sensible way forward. Um, does anyone have any questions on that? No, then thank you, Anna, and we'll take that mini paper at the next um, meeting and um, update on where we get to. Um, the next item on the agenda was local plan health study. Um, so alongside obviously the health and wellbeing strategy with the council is also reviewing its local plan. Um, part of that is a health study um, Unfortunately, it's not ready for this meeting. So we had meant to just drop that off the agenda and, and bring it back, but it was just, um, we will come to the board just for comment and input in terms of what that health health study is and any comments on, on that, because obviously that underpins um, the local planning framework um, for Ealing and health needs is, is part of that. So we will bring that back to the board um, when there's something a bit more substantial to say. Um, the better, care fund plan for 2012 um if i can nip down to that in my agenda um i think is on here just to update you um because i think last time we agreed that i would sign it off um between 
um, meetings. Um, and I don't know, Kerry, if we, we've got an update to give on that before we note it formally. I think the only update is, Chair, that this has now been signed off by the National BCF overseeing body. Um, it's coming through internal council process. I think it comes to Cabinet on the 9th of February. It's gone through the first stage, I think, Nahar, of the CCG process. Um, and I assume it then goes up to North West London. But that's the only update in terms of sign off, Chair. Great. Thank you. Nahar. Sorry, yes, sticky button. But yes, that's correct. It's been through our um, borough committee and signed off there. It um, the final signature from a health side will be <coughs> our accountable officer, and all of them have to be signed by the 31st of January across North West London. So they're all being done as one batch, and there is consistency between them. There's consistency checks between them. Great, thank you. Um, and once this is done, I shall. I've been over Christmas, and I was copied into a million emails flying between. Um, I think the council and and um, the the central team. So I'm looking forward to that kind of slowing down slightly. Uh, but thank you everyone for their work in getting that submission together. Um, a major piece of work. So thank you very much. Um, any questions on BCF then? No, fantastic. Um, then the work program. Um, I, Anna Kerry, did we have an update on future items then, or towards the health and wellbeing strategy? Yeah, I think um, I think future items around that are um, we need to work out the timing for um, some workshops for this board. Um, I think we're going to try and aim to do maybe a couple of non-public meetings in between the public meetings to try and just work through some of those um, priorities for the board, but then obviously bring um, early drafts here to the board in terms of what those priorities are going to look like. Um, we are taking our annual public health report this year is going to be um, essentially a write up of the COVID integrated impact assessment, which we've brought here um, as it's as it's gone on over the last few months. Um, that's going to be signed off by cabinet in March. So it may be at the next meeting or possibly virtually uh, we can share that with this group. And then that's really the start of the discussions about what's going to be in that strategy. Um, but I'll aim for the next meeting to come with a time, more of a time scale for that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, and in terms of future agenda items, I'm, as I said earlier, hopeful that we can drop the COVID update, uh, or maybe if there are important issues, um, bring them up in urgent matters. Um, but if people are happy, if people, members are happy with that approach, that, that that kind of information is available elsewhere and um, input from partners is sought elsewhere, um, then we'll, we will do that. So unless anyone has any objections, we shall take that as agreed then. Um, so thank you and thank you, Simon, for the, for the suggestion for your update from winter. So obviously we are very ha happy for partners to suggest items um, if they want to update us or get input on anything. So please do um, let myself uh, know as, as chair um, and copying Keith and um, probably Judith um, as well, um, just so we're up, up to date. That would be really helpful. Um, so we're almost at the end. So unfortunately, Roy from um, ESCAG couldn't make it tonight, but he, we did have a couple of questions from him because um, he, he had other urgent business to attend to. Um, do you want to make sure that we do cover them just for the minutes? Um, and I think they're both for you, Kerry, to, to, to respond to. Um, but I just wanted to, so the first one from, from Roy was about the knock-on effect of kind of COVID related closures of care homes um, and then what ha what impact that had in terms of the rest of the sector um, delayed discharges um, and then the impact on informal family carers and, and how the council might be providing more care and support um, to them. So I don't know if you want to just pick that one up very quickly. Thank you Chair. Um, so we've heard from Simon in terms of the impact on delayed discharges and the flow from hospitals. There have been significant challenges, but we've been working as a system to minimise those and ensure that people will only spend as long in hospital as they absolutely need to. Um, the decision making with regard to when care homes close is defined by a um, London wide LCRC body who are the um, London wide um, body for infection control and management. We've been working closely with them to ensure that um, homes are only closed um, appropriately, but also that we're protecting the people who live in the care homes 
and also the staff who work within them. Um, the knock-on impact has meant that with home closures, we've been procuring more domiciliary care support for people to live in the community. Um, and since um, December 21, we've been procuring 10% more home care hours to support people in their own homes, which I think is, again, goes back to Simon's earlier point of home first, but also very much in line with the council's Better Lives programme. We've also been continuing to provide support to informal and family carers um, within restrictions of the various lockdowns and um, expectations in terms of movement within the community, such as closures to daycare, et cetera. But um, I think it is an absolutely valid question and I think some of the responses we've given earlier in the meeting tonight have answered um, Roy's queries. Great, thank you. Um, and then the second one was around the Michael Flanders Centre, which I'm sure as everyone knows, has been the kind of east of the borough's uh, COVID testing facility, uh, the PCR site. Um, so the question is what's happened to the range of services for people living with dementia and their carers that had been provided there up to the start of the pandemic? Um, are day opportunities, carer support groups and advice and information services still being provided from other venues and have any new projects been developed? Thank you. Another very good question from Roy. Um, in terms of the Michael Flanders service, we've been continuing to provide outreach services to people who would otherwise be attending the centre. And that's for existing um, people as well as new referrals to the service. So the staff group haven't been idle whilst the centre has been closed. They've been uh, outreaching into people's homes, providing support, meals, advice and support around other services that are available to their families. Um, we're expecting a review of the um, testing site at the Michael Francis Centre before the end of March this year. Obviously, we'll be working closely with NHS colleagues and um, national bodies um, in terms of that decision to be made. We will open the centre at, at the soonest possible date, but again, we need to make sure that that's carried out in line with the wider needs of the community and also ensuring that the people who use the services are safe. They're a very vulnerable group, the people who use this service, a lot of them are, are, are quite elderly and as you say with dementia so we will be working through that but just to assure Roy and our SCAG colleagues that there's been significant outreach programs being run from the centre whilst it's been closed. Brilliant, thank you. Okay so that takes us to the end of the agenda. Um, the date of the next meeting is, is down as the 9th of March on your agenda papers but I think we are Keith shifting it back a week because we've had to move cabinet which would then take place on the 9th of March so apologies again for the confusion on dates um, but um, the next meeting will be on the 16th of March. Um, yes I, I sorry I, I hadn't been informed of that uh, before this went out so apologies. That's right. I, we may have decided after it went out yeah. um, apologies um, but so just to confirm it's the 16th of March um, 16th. so thank you all very much um, for coming and I will see you in March. Thank you, Chip.